Thanks all for coming. And firstly, um, I'd like to thank the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, the Wijibal people of the Bunjan and ancestors past and present. We have um, Uncle Charles Moran with us today. He's a member of our reference group. We possibly could have got him to do Welcome to Country, but I didn't ask because I wasn't sure whether Annie Thelma was coming. But Uncle Charles will fill us in a little bit later on some of the details of the reference group, if he wants to. So, well, as you know, I'm presenting my PhD and I want to thank the um, Clinical Excellence Commission for funding me full time over the last four years to do this study. And also, um, I want to thank everyone in the room who supported me throughout and listened to my wins and losses. And, and I'm nearly there with this PhD now, four and a half years on. So, <clears throat> today I'm going to be telling the story of the research and there'll be some background to and origins of the project, research questions, the pre-study protocols, as in the local community collaboration and consultation that went on before the study started, phase one, collection of the patient's stories, phase two, service providers' perspectives, phase three, the synthesis of the two perspectives, and then some patients and providers' words to illustrate the outcomes and findings. The main findings and recommendations as they relate to clinical services and renal services. And quickly, publications from the research. I'm doing PhD by publication. I haven't submitted yet, but it may be submitted next week. Um, and four of the chapters are now, well, three are published and the fourth one's last Friday with some revisions necessary and it will go into the BMJ Open online. So they're all open access so anyone can access them online um, and uh, there's a list anyway. Well, it was seeing Aboriginal people in the renal unit where I work um, totally disengaged with people, with staff, with their environment and really ha seeing the majority of renal staff struggling to engage with their, with their Aboriginal patients that was kind of the, the motivation for the study. Seeing their distress and dislocation in the highly biomedical world they're forced to access three days a week to access their treatment got me to thinking what was going on and how things could be changed and improved. Well, I grew up in Tasmania where in the 1960s it was an exclusively white society and I wasn't taught anything at school of any Aboriginal history. In fact, I was taught that the last Tasmanian Aborigine, um, Truganini, died in Hobart in the 1800s, and that was it. I was taught nothing else. And so even as a child, I spent time in the bush on my own, wondering what was going on, why the Aboriginal people weren't there anymore, and dreaming, daydreaming about the lives they would have spent before we came with our guns and our diseases and our convicts. So fast forward to the mid-90s when I was living in the Northern Territory and my family, my partner and I became close to families of the Gagadu people and I realised that every family we knew had at least one family member relocating to Darwin for dialysis. Shortly after that, my own partner was diagnosed with a hereditary form of kidney disease. So this really became very close to my world. So fast forward to the mid 2000s when I started working in a renal unit locally and I began to see the over-representation of Aboriginal people within the, the renal unit and the poorer outcomes for the patients than their non-Aboriginal counterparts. So several years of yarning with patients and talking to their families about what I was seeing and what they wanted in the way of services as far as accessibility and acceptability went for them, convinced me that this, the community would support me to do this study. So, as I said, Aboriginal people, just under 20% of the patients in the renal unit where I work were Aboriginal when the data was collected from them. 
And Australian Aboriginal people are eight times more likely to have kidney disease than the non-Aboriginal population. They have poorer treatment outcomes. They suffer significantly higher levels of morbidity and mortality. They don't. They die earlier, and they just don't do well in the current system. So rural patients are often forced to travel to regional centres three days a week to access their treatment. And this is usually in an acute unit or a, a satellite unit in a smaller hospital. Most of you know all this, but uh, I wasn't sure who was going to be hearing this. So I enrolled to do my research here at the University Centre for Rural Health. And I began in 2010. And the first thing I did, of course, was formulate the research questions, which was, what are the experiences and perceptions of Aboriginal people on haemodialysis in rural New South Wales? And what are service providers' perceptions, attitudes and beliefs about working with these patients? So the goal of all this was to inform some kind of system change for rural renal services for Aboriginal people. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into much detail about the methods and the methodology and how it was all done today. However, they are published online and they're accessible. But it's a qualitative design and it's incorporated the principles of Indigenous research paradigm and community-based participatory research. Basically, it involved uh, building relationship with the local community and sharing every stage of the research with the patients and their families and being guided culturally by a reference group of Aboriginal people. The methods were heavily reliant on my own levels of reflexivity and regular writing in a journal, given that I had some pretty um, overlapping roles and some very blurred lines between where I sat as a researcher, as a clinician and as the wife of a patient with chronic kidney disease. So, I needed to make sure that this didn't, didn't muddy the waters and um, that the study was going to be a, a rigorous one. So journaling before I started and throughout was part of the methods. As I said, they're published. Um, a vital part of the methodology was the formation of the community reference group which I'm going to ask Uncle Charles to pronounce <laughs> because every time I pronounce it, I get it wrong. And he's our Bundjalung language expert. <laughs> Have we got a microphone? Can you say that? Hello. Yeah, uh, to talk about a kidney, my kidney is pronounced in Aboriginal language, Ngalinga Bulun. That's what, that's what it's written up there on the board. Ngalinga Bulun. Well, Ngalinga means our, and Bulun means our kidney. So that's what it is. Yeah, so the National Health and Medical Research Guidelines um, state that anyone doing research with an Aboriginal community must have a reference group of, of involved local Aboriginal people to, to guide the study and to give that, that community a voice throughout. And I've also had a wonderful supervisory team of four, uh, four academics, two of whom are Indigenous. Sean, who's here today, is an... I still have. Can you say it? A Pasqua... <laughs> or Pasquayak. A Pasquayak Cree man from northern Manitoba in Canada now living in Lismore. And I also had an associate, Professor Janelle Sterling, who's a Dungari woman from Kempsey. And they've really helped me immensely throughout. So, as I said, the community and consultation that went through, went on before the study started, helped me to form the reference group. And of the 11 patients I spoke to over two or three years before the study started, five had passed away by the time the study began. So that sort of says a lot in itself. But the reference group consists of in-centre patients, home patients, 
a former patient who's now who's since had a transplant, Aboriginal health workers and educators, and also Rebecca, who's here today, and Matt have been part of that reference group as well. And the role of the group has been to provide cultural knowledge, advice and guidance, which kept the research on track throughout and also gave Aboriginal the Aboriginal community a voice and input and got gave them the opportunity to comment on the papers that were produced at each phase. So maybe Uncle Charles would like to come up and say something about his involvement in the group. I think he was hoping to, if, if that's okay with you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Charles Moran, and I'm here on behalf. I would like to support Elizabeth. Such a great job that she's doing. I've got a lot of respect for her because she is a really understanding person. That's why I've taken up with her in the first place. She understands people, especially Aboriginal people. I know we are a bit hard to understand, but she's one of the people that taken it up. And uh, see, with, when they come into come into here for treatment, into the like for their dialysis, they're so shy, my people. You know, they don't want to mix with white people, and they don't mix with their own people a lot too. But Liz understands all this and she's trying to get them to come together. And that's why I thought now, well, I may be able to come in there and try and help us sort it out. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm here today, because I've got so much respect for Liz and I think she's doing such a wonderful job. And I hope she carries on for a lot longer because we need her. Perhaps one day I'll be on dialysis, which I hope not, but you never can tell. So I'd like to see Liz carry on and you're mighty welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uncle Charles, but you were supposed to talk about the group, not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the one who's running it. <laughs> okay. So, to phase one. So, this was the um, collection of the patient stories and I recruited the Aboriginal patients via a snowballing technique which was several patients came on board and told me their stories. People who I had built relationships with as one of their nurses and then they recommended the study to others. So, by the end of the recruitment stage, I was delighted to have 18 of the 21 patients in this area tell me their story, which was 86%. So that was pretty great. So the interviews were unstructured. I used a yarning and storytelling technique, which really helped to connect in a more Aboriginal way and to enhance rapport and, and comfort during the interviews. We did a thematic analysis of the data and this was refined and validated by the two expert groups, which were, were the supervisory team and the reference group. Um, the emerging themes were pre presented to the reference group several times before they were confirmed. And the titles and descriptions of the themes are presented in the words of the participants and then related back to clinical practice and health services. This is a painting of the data analysis and it's done by the late Patsy Nagus, who was a dialysis patient. She was a very active and passionate member of the reference group and many of you will know that she was also a passionate campaigner for reconciliation and for better services for her people. And she painted this after I presented the emerging findings to the group. So it's an Aboriginal view of the study, of that phase of the study. 
So just to give you a key, it's actually the originals hanging over the stairs over the hallway. And it's a beautiful piece of work. But she, when I presented the findings, she painted the sun to represent family, which is the overall mediator that continues to bring people back for their treatment. And the, the sun rays are the love and the support of family that enables the patients to continue their journey along the river of life. And I think it's the Clarence River. The footsteps are the six themes, and the six themes describe a patient journey from the biggest shock of my life, which was the shock of late, often late diagnosis and crisis initiation onto dialysis. Beats the alternative, but it messes up your life, is where people begin to feel better from their treatment, but they're also starting to realise the huge impact that it's having on their families and their communities and their lives. Family is everything is once again reiterating the motivation for people to continue to come back for their treatment. Wish I had one of them nurses to help me at home is about most of the patients expressed a desire for home dialysis, but many were reluctant to put the responsibility for their care and dialysis onto their families. So they were really expressing a desire to have regular visits from renal nurses to help them to stay at home on country with their family. Don't use them big jaw breakers is about patients feeling culturally unsafe at times, especially in hospital settings, but also about the fact that they want more simple everyday language being used to explain their treatment and their disease. Stop them following us onto the machine was universally the patients expressed a desire to be, to really to re-empower themselves by contributing to education strategies for future generations about their risk factors for renal disease. The hands are the reconciliation that Patsy saw being brought about between us clinicians and patients through the research. And the shells are shell creatures that live in the Clarence River. <laughs> so how does all this relate to, to um, clinical practice? Well, as I said, the family is the overall mediating factor. There's no surprises in the fact that we need more effective screening programs, universal screening programs for Aboriginal people. Despite the best efforts of many services in this area, they're still slipping through the cracks. People expressed a desire for a patient-driven model of care that acknowledges the vital role of family and culture within, within their treatment, the vital role of family and culture for the well-being of Aboriginal people. And there's a need for an Aboriginal support person to act as a cultural bridge, especially within renal units and between staff and patients in acute settings. So in effect, a renal-specific Aboriginal liaison officer. Incidentally, I, I found some documents that were produced 10 years ago um, by an Aboriginal liaison in the area requesting a renal specific Aboriginal liaison because she simply didn't have time to get up to the renal unit. People identified shortfalls in cultural safety and understanding between patients and renal staff. And once again, they, they expressed their desire to re-empower themselves by being part of education for their, for their younger generation. There was even several patients suggested that they'd like to be part of educating staff about lo local and family cultural issues. So that was the patient data. And then the next phase was um, recruitment and interviewing renal service providers. Um, so the, there was a purposive sample of renal and allied service providers. And of 31 people invited, we invited people to try and cover a broad range of perspectives and from a diversity of disciplines. And 29 people participated out of that invitation. So for this, I used semi-structured interviews, but guided by short case studies. Um, the case studies were developed from patient stories that they told me themselves. So they actually encompassed the major concerns of the patient and the issues that they felt needed to be addressed. So they were a very valuable tool in helping to sort of focus interviewees on the issues that we really needed to be talking about before we started. It was a thematic analysis again, and it was again critiqued and validated by expert groups. And in addition to this, in this phase, 
uh, we had a, a small group of renal clinicians who came together and helped to validate the findings and confirm that they rang true with their own experience. So this is who I interviewed. There was senior management and a policy maker. There were nephrologists and a BMO, a hospital medical officer, nurse unit managers, in-centre renal nurses, home dialysis nurses, community nurse, nurse practitioner, renal social workers, Aboriginal health workers and Aboriginal liaison officers. So we got a broad range of perspectives. That's a sample of one of the case studies that we used and I might just let you read that because it it kind of gives you an idea of some of the issues. Well, from the service provider's data analysis, five themes surrounding the theme of the overarching theme of systemic cultural understanding will provide better services. So responding to social complexities was mostly around family and culture and it was under that was respecting but challenged by patients' family obligation that staff are aware of the fact that sometimes people are making assumptions about pa patients' socioeconomic and family status, the need for more individualised care, and then under promoting empowerment, trust and rapport, there was bridging gaps in cultural understanding, acknowledging relationships between land, people and environment, and being time poor, particularly in acute settings, being time poor from the point of view of clinicians to have the time to build stronger relationships. The rigidity of service design was about transport and access issues, participants' views of the inevitable home treatment failures they were seeing, pressure of system overload and that impacting on services, limited of efficacy of cultural awareness training and conflicting priorities in the acute settings. There was also Quite a strong theme of inadequate screening and diagnosis being lost opportunities and needing to prioritise prevention. And discrimination and racism sits over inherent judgement of lifestyle choices, inadequate cultural awareness compromising patient safety within hospitals, pervasive multi-level institutionalised racism and managing patient distrust of mainstream services. But once I sat down and tabled the two sets of results, I realised that whilst people were saying things in really different language and coming from very different perspectives and contexts, basically the core of what they were saying about services was very similar. So to illustrate this, patient theme of bigger shock of my life about diagnosis and starting dialysis is mirrored by inadequate screening and diagnosis or service providers' perspectives of the lack of diagnosis or late. Family is everything is mirrored by responding to the social complexities and how people are prioritising family over their treatment. If I had one of them nurses to help me at home, is mirrored by service providers' perspectives that it, there is indeed inadequate home renal nurse support for many patients. So I'll just show you a few, a few quotes because I think it's the best way of illustrating how this stuff emerged. So on late or no diagnosis, this man said, I didn't know I had kidney problems because I was pretty active, fishing, hunting, golfing there, until one day, day I but felt a bit crook there. So they rushed me to hospital and when I woke up I was in the intensive care ward and they said, oh yeah, you have to go down to dialysis and get blood into you. Your kidneys have had it. And this, this senior manager said, so we've got Aboriginal people dying of renal disease who don't even know and their GPs may, may not have made the diagnosis in their 40s or 50s with hypertension, cardiovascular disease. But there will be an underlying renal failure that's not even being managed, let alone diagnosed or assessed. On developing trust and rapport between clinicians and patients, 
but the majority of our people are very shy. They're frightened to ask questions of anybody, especially a white person, and that's why they find they've got a few problems, because they're frightened to ask for some advice. I've learned in the last 18 months that rapport really needs to be built with these patients um, because we see them day in and day out for the rest of their lives and we really need to understand each other. Just you feel free to interrupt me or um, tell me you've had enough of the words and I'll move on but I think it's kind of a really good way to illustrate how we've come up with these findings. So inadequate renalness support. You cannot expect a lot of Aboriginal people to take on the dialysis responsibilities in their own homes. We need more support. People have gotten institutionalised. But if they had some encouragement, they could do it. Because what we're doing wrong is taking our people out of country and breaking their cultural spirit, and this is wrong. We're setting people up to fail. We give them a great training here in the home training unit, but then we send them home with maybe only one home visit in the first three to six months. And you sit here anxiously waiting for the call for help. And often they won't even call you when they need help. Next thing you hear, they're in ICU, fluid overloaded or with sepsis. So once this congruence became really, really obvious, the third phase of the study began. And that was to answer this, this question, how can Aboriginal patients and their service providers' experience and perspective inform improvement to renal services for Aboriginal people in rural New South Wales. That's a map of some of the congruence I found once I put the patient themes on one side and the provider themes on the other side. So from there we went back to the, to the whole data set and combined the two data sets and started to look at people's reference to services and improvement and we looked at the convergence and divergence of their words across that question. So from there four themes emerged. Four themes that came from both data sets of engaging patients earlier, flexible family focused care, managing fear of mainstream services and service provision shaped by culture. And it became obvious that if these three, these four themes could be, be addressed in some way, that we will indeed avoid the costly crisis. And the costly crisis isn't just in a fiscal sense. It's in the physical, the emotional, the spiritual, the damage that it does to individual patients, their families and their communities, but also the great expense that this stuff is happening. What's happening at the moment is putting on to the health service and it's unsustainable. So we do need to do something. Once again, I've used the words. Um, I'm not very good at tables and quantitative stuff, so words are my thing. So to sort of illustrate how this emerged, in my engaging patients early, well, so a lot of Aboriginal people, they neglect themselves in many areas until the last minute. It could have been prevented, you know, but you need the resources and staff to come out and set up programs. And this person said, once they're on the machine, the system has failed and the system will have had many opportunities for interventions. So the challenge for Aboriginal people is actually to get effective, reasonable, pre-dialysis, pre-end stage care. That's the biggest single challenge these people face. Flexible family focused care. Well, this lady said, when all this happened, I got them all together to have a family conference. And when, and when my oldest boy put his hand up and said, well, mum, I'll give you a kidney. My other son jumped up and said, well, mum, I'll come and be your carer. And my baby son put his hand up and said, well, mum, I'll learn the machine with you. So straight away, the family was onto it, wanted to deal with it with me. And a, a nurse said, I think the hardest thing in, in working in the healthcare system and working with Aboriginal people is their family problems. It's difficult when you've got scenarios where he puts all his family first and arrangements for a funeral and all that. They've definitely got lots more commitments other than dialysis. And dialysis isn't a priority for them at those times. Well, in the hospitals, where you've got a lot of young Aboriginal people, they're not used to being sick and they go 
to these places and it's a foreign country to them and they're frightened to ask for anything. If they got an Aboriginal health worker there in the building, in the renal unit there, then it'd be different. It would make a big difference. And this manager of an Aboriginal medical service said, I suppose it all comes down to the level of support and access. People basically want to be home with family. I suppose access is the major thing. Can you imagine travelling for hours to dialysis, four to five hours in a chair? That's crazy. That's 13 hours every day, three days a week. So managing patient fear of mainstream services. When the doctors and staff explain things to the Aboriginal patient, I found what they do, they talk in big university words, big jaw breakers, instead of just you talking plain English so you can understand it. And this renal nurse said, they've probably got good reason to feel that way, discriminated against at times, because I mean in general they've come from the history of Aboriginals where they've felt isolated. They're still dealing with it, they're still talking about it. Oh, I don't feel like the renal staff do it intentionally at all, but that separation is there and we need to acknowledge it a little more maybe. It all started when um, so-and-so was a young girl. She had a kidney infection. But her mother couldn't take it to the doctor because if our mothers took us to the doctor for any reason, then the welfare would come and take us kids away. All she needed was a dose of antibiotics. I think there's an element of a lack of understanding of the past policies that were in place where Aboriginal people were taken away from hospitals, you know, removed the stolen generation and the grief and loss that associates with that. And just finally, Service provision shaped by culture. This man said, I think they need to get back to school, learn about Aboriginal issues and have some cultural values about them, Aboriginal cultural values. Because half the time their attitude towards Aboriginal issues and values keeps Aboriginals away. Aboriginals don't want to go and listen to them, they stay away and at the end of the day the Aboriginal suffer. And this is a quote from a nurse, we could all do with more cultural awareness in the workplace but that comes from the culture of the organisation. The culture of the organisation is at fault, not the culture of the individual unit. So I'm just going to quickly apply these four themes to services and policy. It's it's a very big topic and I can, only, I can only address a few things but uh, I've done my best. So engaging patients earlier. Well as we all know early detection is vital and screening programs are not capturing everyone at the moment and patients and providers alike describe the fact that they realise that perhaps these need to be managed really well in conjunction between renal services and Aboriginal medical services. And I know that this, they're trying to do this, but it's still, not, it's still not working. We need to slow disease progression by developing an effective Aboriginal pre-dialysis pathway. And this needs to incorporate culture and family and with measures that will encourage that person with the support of their family to stay on that pre-dialysis pathway, having then the potential to hold off dialysis or perhaps avoid it even in the future. We need to support the families to keep doing that. We need to support the families by, by an Aboriginal support person who could be in rooms at diagnosis and could go away with the family and spend time explaining to the family why the person needs to make these changes now to avoid massive changes later. But explain it to them in their own context, not coming from a, a medical point of view. Um, we do have the potential to avoid dialysis if we can get people screened and staying on pathways. And there's a huge cost saving here with the potential to avoid dialysis or the unplanned commencement of dialysis which is known to be extremely costly. Costly in acute beds, costly in lengthy hospital stays but also costly to the patient, the patient's wellbeing and their family. So flexible family focused care 
Well, once again, we need to improve engagement at diagnosis via this Aboriginal specific pre dialysis pathway and an Aboriginal support person. We need flexibility within renal services for family and cultural ob obligation and increased home renal nurse support to enable home dialysis. One man said to me that he would like to do his own dialysis at home, but his wife is simply terrified of helping him to do that, but that if he had regular visits from nurses to keep him on track, that she would probably agree to it. But she realised, she knew from another person's experience that those nurses might only come every three to six months. We need to increase understanding by health institutions of the crucial role of family and culture in the treatment and well-being of Aboriginal patients. We need some flexibility, more flexibility within renal services simply by giving people more access to home dialysis. We need, but we also need to raise health institutions' understanding of the role of family and the role of family and culture in the well-being of patients. Obviously, as, as the renal people in the room would probably know, if we every patient we get onto home dialysis is saving the system approximately $30,000 a year after an initial training set up a fee of around 15000 I think these figures are fairly current. So by getting a couple of patients home on dialysis, the savings just from that could potentially fund increased renal nurse support quite easily. So these changes are, are not going to cost money. It's, we've looked at the pragmatic ways to try and change the services by not having to have a huge outlay of, of money and resources, but perhaps by reassigning some resources. Importantly, managing patient fear of mainstream services. Well, this, this fear has come from two sources. It was reported to me that firstly, most Aboriginal people have seen their family members die on dialysis or have less than optimal outcomes. They've had family members that have chosen not to go on dialysis in the past and they've, they've, seen, they've seen it all really. But it also, this fear is coming from a history of overtly racist treatment within mainstream health services and other mainstream organisations that we all know has been going on since colonisation and, and has until recent years been quite, quite blatant. So patients in their 40s, 50s and 60s are still left with those feelings. One lady reported, two ladies reported being born in the mortuary of the casino hospital in the 1950s because their mothers weren't allowed to birth in the maternity unit. Another, and that other instance of the lady who had a, a kidney infection at eight, which could have been fixed with antibiotics, but her mothers had had another child taken when she'd taken the child to the doctor in the early 1960s, so that woman never got that treatment for her kidney infection. So if we can address these, this fear of mainstream services by having organisations reflect on the treatment that patients have received in the past and the residual things that are still left in policies today from the bad old days, perhaps we can get people to engage better with us. Once again, if we can address this fear, we will reduce acute, acute admissions and there will be improved treatment outcomes. There's a, a couple of studies done in remote Australia have shown that patients doing their own home dialysis with limited access to medical support but being given the responsibility for their care and being supported by renal nurses are experiencing comparable outcomes to their non-Aboriginal counterparts. So service provision shaped by culture. Well, both participant groups had reports of being concerned about the current model of cultural awareness training. I worked in the renal unit six years before I got to the mandatory one day, one day um, respecting the difference training. And it was fantastic. It was a great day. But I was told by a manager I interviewed for this that there is 
never going to be enough money and enough resources to get all these all our staff to this training. You need to backfill the staff for the day and then there's the cost of the training and the trainers and the food and the premises and in the renal nurse context it's it's difficult to have you can't be backfilled by any nurse. You have to have a renal nurse to replace you to get you there. Um, and, and the pressure of time is restricting. I, I don't think 50% of our nurses have been to that training. I don't know. But uh, one, one uh, option was suggested by several brave patients that they be part of the education process themselves and their families. But there was another suggestion from several sources about elders delivering cultural education, paid elders coming into the hospitals and having informal tea room chats and being on site for, for clinicians who are needing support and help when treating Aboriginal people. So those elders could go to areas where there's a high traffic of Aboriginal patients, not necessarily replacing the one day respecting the difference training but enhancing and giving ongoing sustained support and informal education. So helping patients and staff to build relationship through learning more about each other and building relationships. So cost savings, well backfilling clinicians to the one day off site training if they can't get there and the cost of educators, catering and site costs. This needs a lot of work, but this is what the data is telling us. So, interestingly, the two groups displayed in their interviews really minimal actual individual racism. People expressed wanting more understanding and not knowing enough, but they also expressed the desire to, to get more understanding and more education about Aboriginal issues. So both groups expressed the goodwill and willingness to develop positive relationships and increase two-way understanding. However, it's been identified that there's still residual racism within the mainstream health service and its policies. And it's going to take reflection by the institutions themselves on how this is happening for things to change because currently there is this inertia to change within institutions because of the pressure of the, the load on hospitals and the load on clinicians and the load on the health service. It's not a priority. But we do need health services to acknowledge and address the effects of the past overt racism that Aboriginal people have experienced. So in order to describe this in the last chapter of my thesis, um, I've coined a new word and I'm hoping to get it at least into Wikipedia soon. Given that I've, I've used a high level of reflexive practice and I've published a paper about this, about clinicians needing to do this, I started to read about organisational reflexive practice and it's quite, it's, there's quite a lot published about it, about organisations needing to reflect on how their policies and their practices are impacting on the people they're servicing. So the word that I coined was reflexibility and I defined it as the ability of institutions to reflect on and acknowledge the negative impacts of their institutional behaviours, policies and practices on individuals and or minority groups and provide flexibility within services to address the diverse social and cultural imperatives of these groups. So just quickly, four chapters, three chapters are published and one was accepted last Friday for um, publication and they're all open access journals. So clinicians can access them freely at any time online. So the methods paper is published in the uh, Rural and Remote Health Journal online. It was published in June and a thousand people reviewed it in the first five weeks, so that was pretty nice. Considering that six journals rejected it and said it would never be published before, <laughs> before we finally got it in. <laughs> Mind you, it got a lot of rewriting in that time and, and was polished. So. 
Then the service provider's perspectives is published in the BMJ Open and that's freely accessible. And then the combined perspectives of the two has come out last week in Hemodialysis International and that's open access online. And the final paper, which really should have been published first, reporting the patient stories, is has been provisionally accepted by BMJ Open. And it's interesting, it was rejected by, I think, six journals. I've, I'm into double figures for rejections and I've become an expert at it, but the patient data paper wasn't published by five journals because we refused to take the patient voice out. We wrote it in the patient voice. The themes are presented in the patient's words. And these journals want us to, wanted us to take those words out and put them in a table at the end of the paper, and we refused to. So finally we've won, and it's going to be published as is. And that's it. Thank you. Done. I'm hoping someone might have some questions. <laughs> I'm just interested in, um, of course, the um, um, early detection. Um, it's a shame that none of the AMS guys are here. Um, that is an environment that's usually done in, in an AMS or a GP setting, um, not necessarily in, in a hospital setting. How do you feel? How, how can you... Um, let me just try and work out how I'm going to say this. Individual clinicians are responsible for testing, usually a doctor. How do you think you can influence them to improve that um, in a GP or an AMS setting to, to make a difference? That's a great question. <laughs> um, well, there is, I mean, Jane knows there's this, this is policy about screening people when they come through emergency. And it's not, it's a policy directive, but it's not actually, there's not enough time or enough staff to implement it. And it's all about resources. I think the Aboriginal Medical Services perhaps engaging more with mainstream renal staff or greater capacity for the mainstream to collaborate with AMS working closer together. I don't know how I'm to answer to make that happen. Um, people talking, communicating. There are guidelines for adult health checks and there are a number of processes that are being put in place in AMSs across New South Wales and other places around quality improvement to put in systems that encourage those checks to be done and the routine screening. So anyone with diabetes is you know, meant to get their 12 month checks and so forth. Um, so the evidence around how to change clinician behavior suggests that things like audits and feedback help. Um, flagging on the medical director or the other computer systems, um, guidelines and policies within an organisation and training of staff. And those are the things that help. And there are a number of uh, programs actually being implemented by New South Wales Health at the moment in the AMSs across here, including at Casino, um, trying to improve those things and put those sorts of processes in place. So hopefully what we'll see is more screening taking place and then more follow-up from the screening. So it's not just about screening, but then the ongoing mm. follow-up. Um, firstly, congratulations, Liz. I think your commitment to getting something very valid and robust on things that we've all felt very strongly about and had an understanding of for a long time is greatly appreciated and I can see that it's got an international, would have an international interest and it's very important for you know new nurses, undergraduate nurses and the general community to um, enhance their understanding and words like racism and things like that can be very um, discouraging when pe to people not opening their mind to it rather than closing and your stories using you, the way you're presenting it in the stories provides a real example of it and I think will open up people's minds to what racism actually is rather than being closed and um, to that. So congratulations. Um, just in regards to what we were talking about before, um, the study is about perspectives 
and it's qualitative. So while the outcomes are very clear and the 20%, you know, the, the percentages and the dis disproportionate number of people on dialysis is an obvious outcome that's very much for improvement, um, the, the reality is this is like a perspective perspectives paper and a qualitative paper so it, it's for people to understand it's not actually um, we haven't robustly um, done a quantitative study on what is being provided and what isn't being provided mm. and not that, that that's not a flaw but just no. that, pers that the reality is that it's a perspectives paper and that's very important you know perspective is hugely important and qualitative but um, I think I wonder if anybody out of in the research world might be interested in doing a follow-up quantitative study of services that do exist and um, and what impact they are having would be an interesting follow-up study but congratulations I think you've done an amazing job and I'm um, proud to be a colleague oh thank you I think um, I'm going to apply for a grant when I get out of this and get this submitted I'd like to apply for a grant to continue the work and if I'm successful, it would pay for an Aboriginal person to work alongside me to consult with the local community and the renal service to um, attempt to devise the pre-dialysis pathway. And if we could get an, a sufficient money to perhaps have that person act as piloting the support role as well, a local Aboriginal person. Mm. That's as far as I've got with with it so far um, but I've also I have a good relationship with several of the AMSs and I'm hoping to to as you said to have more research done I'd love to have the time and the energy to do it myself but I think it needs doing well I know it needs doing as you say doing an audit of services and who's accessing what where and mm, that's right Originally I, I thought I would do a mixed method study. I was looking at exploring the patient's experiences and then looking at one measure as in perhaps fluid status between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal patients or, or, or another measure. But when I started to go into the data I realised that we really needed to find this stuff out. That we really needed to know both sides of the coin and how people were viewing it. And some of that work had done, been done in other areas. So we knew that people weren't having the same outcomes. We knew that things weren't, weren't going well and that the morbidity and mortality figures, there was too many disparities. We knew that, but we needed this can perhaps help us to understand why. I just was thinking further about my previous question um, in regards to influencing the, the individual clinician. Nothing is, and you've de demonstrated this, Liz, nothing's more powerful than the patient word. Um, and it shouldn't just be heard in this forum. Um, it, it must be taken more broadly to not just the AMSs. They always get blamed for not doing what they're supposed to be doing in Aboriginal health, but they're not the only providers. Um, and I think that you need to take that, that this information to uh, the GP setting. That's the only thing, once it resonates with the clinician, that um, will change their practice. All the guidelines and all the protocols in the world won't necessarily change a practice, but a patient might. And that's part of my findings, is that um, in my final chapter I talk about the, the, all the good rhetoric contained in government guidelines and all the goodwill and all the nice speak about how things should be, but it's still not happening. Those policies and guidelines still aren't changing the outcomes for the patient. I am planning to do a series of in-services around the renal units, hopefully, and go and present the findings to the staff at each unit a few times. Um, I would have liked to have been back and done that now, particularly to acknowledge the people who participated. But I'm nearly there and I'll be able to sort of have some downtime to do that soon. And I'm hoping that doing that will help to trigger more thinking and suggestions and brainstorming. Ten brains are better than one. Yeah, thank you so much for listening and coming along. I really appreciate it. It's, just, it's made my day seeing so many renal people here. Thank you. Thank you.